Welcome everyone to today's event. My name is Sam and I am from Prosper and we're helping to put on today's event with um, our great colleagues from Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians of this land. Um, for me here in Melbourne, that is the Rundri and the Boon Wurrung peoples. I'd also like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, but with me here today, I've got a number of team members from the Norton Rose Fulbright team, um, from a variety of offices as well. Um, but I might start firstly with Jimmy, um, who will quickly introduce the team um, and also Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, over to you, mate. Great. Thank you so much, Sam, and a very big welcome to all of you. And thank you again for your time in joining us today. We're thrilled that you are taking an hour out of your time to get to know us a little bit better. Um, and yet, yeah, generally, thank you for being with us. I also want to echo Sam's um, acknowledgement and, um, of country and would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and acknowledge all the traditional of the lands in which we meet um, and particularly give that a very warm welcome to um, everyone joining the call today. So um, as I mentioned we have a number of people from across all of our offices in Norton Rose Fulbright joining us this afternoon to answer all of your hard-hitting questions that we are very keen to answer. Um, so by way of background very quickly, um, I am responsible for managing our national graduate and clerkship programs nationally. So I'm based in Sydney, but will um, be heavily involved in the recruitment uh, process for all of our offers nationally. Joining us, we have um, Laura Johns, who's a partner in our financial restructuring and insolvency team in Sydney. David Jukes, who's a partner in our corporate M&A team in Perth. We've got Martin Rustam, a newly promoted senior associate in our litigation team in Brisbane. Remy Nicholson, who is a graduate in our financial services team in Melbourne. And Trilby Donald, who is a lawyer um, on the grad program in Sydney that's actually doing, a pro, uh, doing one of her rotations in our in-house pro bono team. So a really good mix of different areas across the firm, different levels of seniority in different offices to answer those questions that you have. Um, before we kind of dive in, I guess I just want to take the opportunity to give a bit of an overview for you around our national clerkship program, irrespective of whatever office or um, location that you're interested in applying for. The purpose of our clerkship program is really to allow you as students in their penultimate year or final year of studying your law degree to really get an understanding of what it's like to work as a junior lawyer at our firm. So gone are the days of you doing, you know, um, administration or meaningless tasks you will genuinely be adding real value and contribution to us if you were to join us as a clerk. So the whole point of the program is to allow you to experience life as a graduate. So what that means is that you will be working alongside our lawyers, our senior associates, our partners in teams making a valuable contribution to our matters. So we'll go into that in a lot more detail as we go in this discussion. Um, but I guess from um, an application perspective, I just want to highlight some key dates for you just to you know, answer some of those burning questions that you have. So in order to submit an application for our program, you need to apply through our graduate recruitment website. Application dates vary from state to state. I appreciate that that's slightly confusing. Um, however, we're kind of dictated by the date set by each um, state's law society um, requirements. So for those of you in Sydney, you need to chop chop. Applications close next Wednesday, the 14th of July. Um, and then in Perth, it's a little bit later, the 1st of August. Um, 
Brisbane on Friday the 13th of August and Melbourne, you've got the longest. Um, you've got a couple more weeks on the 15th of August. That's the end date. Um, we can talk through the application process and how to provide you those tips and hints on how to submit the best application um, over the course of the next hour or so. But that's kind of enough for me. I would love to hear your questions and allow my colleagues from across the country to help give their advice and, and insights for the questions that you have. So we're in your hands, over to you. Awesome. Well, um, did anyone of the, any of the other teammates from Norton Rose want to do a quick intro as well, potentially? A quick five, five second intro. Might start with um, David. I can see you're off mute, so maybe a quick, quick five second. I mean, Jimmy's already given a bit of bit of background on what you do, but any, yeah, what's sure, the... Sam. No problem. And hi, everyone. Um, so, look, as Jimmy said, I'm a corporate partner based in the, the Perth office, um, one of two M&A specific partners. Um, there's five of us that comprise sort of the corporate partnership in Perth. Um, I've been at the firm for, or returned to the firm rather, um, for three years now. Uh, prior to that, I was at another national firm uh, for about six years. Um, and before that was at, was at Norton Rose the first time around. Um, I've worked in Perth predominantly, and as a result of that, sort of my main areas are, are mining um, and oil and gas uh, energy and energy transition, which is a, a growing part of the practice now. Um, but I've also spent a term in Melbourne uh, and a term in Hong Kong uh, as well. Um, my practice focuses mainly on public markets, M&A, uh, and equity capital markets. Awesome. I throw to Laura next. I'm picking on whoever's got themselves off mute. So... Um, fair warning. Thanks, Sam, and um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Jimmy says, um, my name's Laura Johns. I'm a partner in our Sydney office, and I specialise in um, restructuring and insolvency work. Um, I work a lot um, with uh, the major banks um, and other financial institutions. Um, and I also work with uh, insolvency practitioners um, and other creditors on in um, distressed and stressed um, uh, situations. Um, there, there's 11 um, partners in our, in our Sydney office and um, 16 partners nationally in this space. So we're, we're a very big team within the firm um, and we work for a variety of clients doing a whole range of different work. Um, I've been with the firm um, with Norton Rose Fulbright for four years, um, but I joined upon the combination with another firm, Henry David Shork, um, four years ago. Um, I, I originally trained in London um, and moved over to Australia as a reasonably young lawyer. Um, and obviously, there's a lot to love here, so I um, have never gone back. <laughs> but um, we look forward to answering your questions this afternoon. Awesome. Remy, you're up next. Quick intro. Um, Sam, thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Nice to virtually meet you all. Um, my name is Remy, and I'm a grad in the financial services team. As Jimmy said, I'm currently doing my first rotation. So I started in March of this year, and I clerked in the corporate M&A team in November 2019. Um, the majority of work I've been doing over the last six months has been to do with superannuation funds. Um, but I've also been working with fintech companies, asset managers, hedge funds, and other financial service providers. Awesome. Trilby? Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you here today online. I'm sure some of you are in lockdown in Sydney, like me. Um, so hopefully this is a nice break in the afternoon. Um, I am a lawyer doing my third rotation and I'm currently in our in-house pro bono team. Um, and I've previously done rotations in our environment and planning team here in Sydney and our insolvency team, um, which Laura's in as well. That was my first rotation, which was also brilliant. So I'll keep it short, but um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions. I was a clerk end of 2017 and I remember it's quite daunting. So feel free to ask away. We're here to answer your questions. Awesome. And finally, Martin. Thanks. Um, um, hi, everyone. 
Um, as Jimmy said, I am a senior associate in the Brisbane um, litigation team. Um, so we've got a pretty general, broad um, commercial litigation practice. So we do things like contractual disputes, property disputes, corporate disputes, um, regulatory investigations, um, so acting for regulators. Um, more recently, we've had um, a couple of sort of large incident responses, investigations, and then subsequent litigation. Um, I also have a sort of particular interest in the transport space. So I do a bit of shipping work, um, which has me working um, with our London Singapore offices occasionally. Um, I started my career at the firm as a clerk back in 2014, 15, um, and then as a grad um, in 2017. Um, and then I also spent some time in our London office a couple of years ago as well. So I'm happy to talk about those experiences as well this afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Now it's, now it's time for the, I'm not that this hasn't been fun, but the fun part of the uh, Q&A where we hear from you all. Um, in terms of the format for asking questions and, uh, and the like, if you could start putting your questions into the chat box, because there'll be a lot coming through just so we can manage um, who goes where and whatnot. Um, if you can also write whether or not um, you want it to be directed at a particular person and also whether or not you're happy to read it out loud yourself. It, it's okay if you not, don't feel comfortable, whether you got, you know, you're on, in transit or something like that. Um, but if you do feel comfortable taking yourself off mute, let us know so I can call on you. Um, and um, you can ask you, ask questions, hopefully face-to-face -face or at least verbally. Um, while I'm waiting for some to come in, and just a reminder, I'm just putting it right, right your questions here. Um, there's a, actually, there's already a question in here from Lucy. Lucy, will you happy to take yourself off mute um, to ask your question? Um, sure. So I have a question for Remy and Trilby. Um, how did you decide your rotations? Um, so when, like the way the rotations work after the, so most people in a clerkship will do the, try out two teams so you have a little idea about which team you might want to go in but at the start of yeah so you, you can kind of put preferences down and obviously that depends a bit on resourcing in the team and what big projects they've come up for me I chose insolvency um, because oh it's a really good question actually I well I actually met a few of the partners while I was clerking in that team and it's a big team. It was a market leading team. And I was really interested in just learning a bit more about that. I hadn't done that at uni. Um, I was in that team why, when COVID first hit. And so that was quite an interesting time to be in the insolvency space as a lot of businesses thought they were going to or did go into distress. So yeah, that was really interesting for me. And then for my second rotation, I've always had um, quite a big interest in the environment and I wasn't sure even how that worked on projects and I knew they did a really good mix of advisory work and litigious work so um, in the advisory work they worked quite closely with the corporate team um, on whether that's a due diligence report or more general advisory work um, about what kind of environmental laws apply and that kind of thing and then in the litigious space um, we have a really strong contaminated land practice um, and I was really interested in yeah learning about how that's regulated particularly in a big urban place like Sydney where I live um, so that was how I decided really um, Remy do you want to talk about yours yeah of course thanks Trilby so firstly the firm are really good in terms of running information sessions and whatnot to give you an insight as to what the different teams um, are doing at that particular time. I didn't have a, a particular interest in um, a team, but I wanted to do something different and something that I hadn't been exposed to in the past. I hadn't done any um, work with um, financial service providers um, in my clerkship or any of my previous work experience. So I just decided to mix it up and go for something new. Um, and that's how I ended up in the team. Awesome. I might throw to hopefully answer your question there, Lucy. Um, seeing out if not, but um, I might throw to Dan next. Um, Dan, did you want to take yeah, yourself sure. off mute? Yeah, awesome. Um, I know it's not directly relevant to clerkship applications, but I'd love to hear from some of you uh, with your experiences in being seconded. I mean, 
it's quite limited at the moment, but um, yeah, any experiences? All right, who wants to take this one? Jimmy? Um, Martin, do you want to talk about your experiences with that? Yeah, um, so I mean, in terms of secondments, I think as a sort of catch-all, I would say that at least in my sort of experience and observations, um, sort of formal secondments in terms of things like client placements sort of arise as needed with clients. Um, so the other senior associate in my team, for example, is on secondment to a client at the moment um, who is sort of dealing with a significant incident. Um, so it's sort of, I think, partially as things arise. Um, but more formally, um, as part of the graduate program, the firm does have its sort of international rotation program, um, which obviously <laughs> COVID um, has put a hiccup in things, but um, in a perfect world, um, it is very much part of the graduate experience that you do have an opportunity to apply and go um, to one of our global offices. Um, so I was such, um, certainly fortunate enough to do that in 2018 um, to our London office. Um, which, you know, it, it was a great experience in terms of, you know, still being part of the Norton Rose um, family um, whilst, you know, getting the experience of working in a different um, environment, working with, you know, adapting to sort of a different working culture um, while, you know, working on sort of deals and matters that I wouldn't necessarily get exposed to in Australia. Um, so, so for me, it was a great experience. Yeah. I might also add, Dan, um, just from a different perspective, we've got three of our staff at the moment out on various different, these are corporate secondments, so not secondments to different Norton Rose offices. Um, I'm a huge advocate for them. I uh, have done a couple through the course of my career and nothing shows you how frustratingly painful a private practice lawyer can be than being on the other side of the fence and actually instructing one. So I, I love my team to go out and see what it's like on the client side. Um, we've got someone at South 32 at the moment, um, which is the mining company that was spun out of BHP. Uh, we've got someone at Western Power. Um, for those in Perth, you, you, you know of Western Power. Um, and one individual at Danone, which is actually a French-based multinational food company. Um, they've got brands like Evian, Activia. Um, and our Singapore office do a lot of work with them. And I do a lot of work with the Singapore office. And so as a favour to one of the corporate partners there, we've sort of lent out one of our lawyers um, who's doing a virtual secondment. But if COVID allows, we'll go to Singapore for the last month or two of that. So um, I'm obviously very pro-corporate, but uh, corporate does end up being a team in which you can do a lot of client secondments because, of course, you know, we house a lot of those relationships. Awesome. I might throw to actually to Vincent next. Um, Vincent, are you happy to take yourself off mute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks everyone for your time today for this Q&A. It's very helpful. Uh, my question is for the newer uh, joinees of Norton Rose, so Martin, Remy and Trilby. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, to the extent that you can discuss it here, what has been the most interesting project you've worked on uh, and why? All right, who wants to kick us off? Um, I'm going to pick on Remy, I reckon. Sounds good. Thank you so much, guys. Um, probably one of the most interesting things that I've done at the moment recently was on uh, social media influencers providing financial product advice. So I don't know if you guys have seen recently, but there's this new recent phenomenon where um, TikTok stars and Instagram influencers um, are trying to um, give financial product advice. So um, I looked into um, what the potential regulatory issues was, were with that and uh, whether the client could potentially use um, TikTok stars basically um, to promote their product. Um, which was interesting. And I guess it was interesting because it's, it's very topical at the moment. Um, the regulator looking into it. So um, there are financial review articles everywhere on it. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. When I'll jump in, when I was in the environment and planning team, we worked on a, um, an advisory piece about um, in relation to environmental law in 
sort of preserving um, heritage, I guess. We looked into whether the um, natural sky is something that can be preserved. So that was kind of that challenge, my philosophical understanding of the world and my legal knowledge. And that was a really fun piece of advice to be on. Um, so yeah, you sometimes pick up matters that you really, you get up and go to work in the morning and you really don't think that that's gonna come across your desk. So it's pretty, life's pretty cool as a graduate, I think. Um, I can just jump in with a final example. Um, so something that we've recently settled in our team is um, a large piece of litigation relating to a chemical spill in 2017. Um, and the sort of the streams of evidence that I was um, running with for the last few years related to um, the sort of the chemistry of this particular toxic substance. Um, so I was working very closely with sort of expert, like, Chem expert chemists as well as expert um, remediation um, practitioners um, in terms of putting together their sort of expert and factual evidence as to their involvement um, in the in the incident and the response um, and, the, and the chemical that was involved was sort of it's um, really only coming to light in terms of its toxicity so it's very much sort of at the forefront of, um, of the science around it um, so that was really interesting in terms of actually you know gaining that subject matter knowledge um, alongside the sort of legal side of things. Thanks guys, that's really helpful. Next, I'm gonna to throw to Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, you, let me um, just- Yeah, work. thank you. Yep, there we go, awesome. Uh, thank you all for, for facilitating this discussion this afternoon. My question um, is for anyone. And it's what are the unique characteristics of Norton Rose that set it apart from other firms, um, especially in the clerkship application process when there's lots of firms out there? Why, why Norton Rose? Laura, do you want to give your opinion on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy to give it a go. Um, uh, I mean, Norton Rose Fulbright is um, not only um, a leading national firm, but it is a leading global firm. And I think as a young lawyer, um, at the beginning of your career, what you, what you want is um, a really interesting variety of work, of people to be working with. Um, you want to be working with some real um, leaders in the legal profession. Um, and, and I certainly think that a firm like Norton Rose Fulbright is, is, offers um, that um, diversity, offers that insight, um, you know, and offers those opportunities. Um, as a young lawyer, you don't necessarily know where your interests will lie. Um, but, you know, hearing today about the type of opportunities that, that Trilby and Remy and, and Martin have had during their careers so far, um, I think really demonstrates why a firm like ours is um, really offers a lot for our young lawyers. Um, I also think it's a, a, a good place to work. It's got good people who um, enjoy spending time together and enjoy getting to know each other um, in a, a fulsome way. And, and I think that's really important. Um, spend a lot of time of your life at work um, and getting on with the people and respecting the people you work with is, is incredibly important. And I really think that NRF fosters um, that type of working environment, um, which I think gives people the opportunity to flourish. I'd just add to, to that. Um, I think the second part of what Laura said is is the bit that really resounds with me um, because, you know, there's, let's call it 10 firms nationally, some of which are global, some of which are national, all tier one firms that will give you a cross section of work, good clients, good exposure to technical legal, legal experience. Um, and those firms that are global of that 10, you know, will give you some common opportunities and everything else. So I think it's hard to pick between them in terms of that. But I think the culture is something that, um, you know, certainly I was at this firm and I left it and I've come back to it. Um, so I have experienced um, sort of other cultures. And I think that's where the clerkship process is so very important for you all. And to attend as many of these sessions as you can, to 
to attend as many interviews as you can and just try and pick up on each of those interactions you know, what you think that firm will be like from the people that you're hearing from. Um, because I think even in those, you know, a one hour interview, you'll learn a lot about a firm because each firm does it slightly different. The people at each firm are slightly different. Um, so for me, it's very much a, a, a culture thing at the end of the day um, when you're talking about the, the sort of tier one firms. I completely agree with all of that, David. I think as students probably looking into as an outsider into all of the firms that you're interested in, we probably all look quite similar in the sense of uh, clients that we have, the nature of the work that we do, the expectations that we have around, um, you know, ensuring that we attract and recruit the very best. And it sounds like a real cliche, and I admit this, but it really does come down to culture. You need to make sure that you feel comfortable joining a firm that you feel as though you can bring your whole self to every day um, and that you feel comfortable doing so. So I think kind of building upon what David said before, during your interviews, when you're attending these events, and by the way, I, I, all of us love the fact that you're here proactively spending time with us today, that's a huge tick. Um, but the more of these events that you go to, the more interviews and opportunities that you can connect with people, you need to make an assessment yourself around what you're comfortable, where you're comfortable joining as a potential clerk and starting out your career. So remember that all of your interviews, all of your interactions that you have with a firm is definitely a two way street. In an interview setting, we're going to ask you a series of questions to get to know you better. We expect you to get to know us and ask us a lot of hard hitting grilling questions like you're doing today. So whatever questions that you're asking in an interview, my advice is to try and make them as consistent as you can across the firms that you're interested in exploring so that you can make a really informed decision on the firm that is best for you. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Um, I reckon next we'll go to Lucy Miller, um, who had sent me a question. I, I know we talked about international rotations a bit, but I think your question's quite um, quite a good one. So if you can take yourself off mute, it'd be great. Sure. I think it's sort of um, been touched on already, but it was just about that graduate rotation, the six months in an overseas office and whether when the borders will reopen, that program will be instated. Um, and also about what the requirements were around that, um, whether it's competitive or whether it's open to any grad who wants to take up the opportunity. Yeah, that's a great question, Lucy. I'll take this one. So from, um, look, the minute that borders reopen and we're able to send people overseas and uh, overseas officers are able to accept people, we will be picking that up. I am part of um, a, a global connection of grad recruitment managers and there's a genuine commitment to being able to pick this up as soon as we possibly as soon as we possibly can so fingers crossed two to three years if you were to join us as a grad you will be able to do that um, which is really exciting in terms of the process um, so we send grads um, overseas on an international secondment every six months. So the requirement is, is that you need to have completed 12 months with the firm. Um, so you need to have done two six month rotations before you submit an application or an interest to spend six months in one of our international offices. Um, and so there is a process behind that. It's not an automatic thing that everyone gets to experience. We do ask that you apply um, and you do have to go through um, a process where you meet with myself um, and also another partner from an office um, 
globally where you're, um, I guess, asked a few questions to understand why you want to go overseas to, say, the London office. What do you want to get out of the opportunity? And how would you use the six months working in one of our international offices to advance your career when you return back to Australia? So there is, I guess, a bit of a process around that. Um, but the whole reason why we do that is to ensure that we're selecting the right people to go represent us within the global network and know that we're giving the opportunity to the right people who are going to come back to Australia in six, 12 months or so um, to continue developing um, the international connections that we have within Australia, within the global network. A question that a number of you may have asked um, directly to Sam or through the chat is which offices do we uh, send our grads around the world to? Um, the main offices that we have connections with are with our peers in London, Singapore, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Hong Kong. Um, historically, we have also sent um, grads off to Japan, to offices in Canada and South Africa, and we're really keen to explore opportunities when we're able to, to um, offices within North America as well. Um, but for now, that's a little bit un on hold, which I'm sure you all appreciate, but the minute that we can do that, we'll be sending people off left, right and centre to be able to do that. In terms of numbers um, as well, every six months, historically, we've spent, uh, we've sent anywhere between four to eight grads nationally um, to one of our international offices. So from a national perspective, um, eight out of say um, 30 to grads nationally every six months, the opportunities are definitely there, which is a really exciting thing. Does that answer your question, Lucy? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm going to throw to Frank next. I've just sent you to take yourself off mute um, for a question about um, moving from school to, to work. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to join this session. Uh, so my question is to Remy or to Trilby and I just wanted to know how did you find the crossover from from law school to to the law firm? Um, was there much of a uh, surprise for you? And what was it that you felt that you really need to, needed to work on to be able to succeed in at Norton Rose Fulbright? Um, I'm happy to have a go. I think thinking back to when I first started if going from uni where you're, you, I would say your schedule is a bit more, it's at the same time more routine and it's also more chaotic. Like, you know what it's like last minute trying to reference something three minutes before it's due. That doesn't really happen at work or hopefully not if you're doing well. Um, but so I think that you do get into more of a routine and you get used to that. So that was something that I had to, get used to at uni I certainly had some really long days but I do remember going to the beach on a Tuesday which you don't get to do at work so I think you one of the things is getting used to that full-time routine um, lots of people have worked in a full-time job before they um, get to work get to NRF to work so that might be different for them so I guess yeah routine would be the first thing um, I think the second thing is probably being really open-minded. I found law school, say you were taking four subjects at a time, you were really focused on, you know, at the moment I'm doing contracts and I'm doing insolvency and I'm doing this sort of niche family law subject or something and you really focused in on them. Whereas at work, particularly as a grad where you get exposure to a whole lot of matters, you've got to be ready to pick up anything at any moment in a way, which is exciting, but at the same time requires a lot of time management. So I think that is a skill you really pick up in your first rotation, particularly, and you will get a taste of that um, as a clerk. I think the firm does a really brilliant job at giving clerks exposure to all types of matters. And so that might mean you're working on something and then suddenly you're grabbing your jacket and going to a meeting, which is really exciting as well. But you do learn those skills about time management. And I think, yeah, that 
that is the balancing act of exposure to new and exciting matters and making it work for you, putting your hand up if it if you're not coping, that kind of thing. So yeah, that would probably be the challenges and things I learned in my first um, rotation. Does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. No worries. Remy, did you want to have a crack? Yeah, I'll just add, it's obviously a steep adjustment. Um, I'm not a morning person, so having to get to work each day at 8.45 has definitely been a challenge for me. Um, I've finally gotten there and I'm pretty proud of myself, I'm not going to lie. Um, but yeah, you just get used to it. It's a learning process um, and it's also exciting um, and fun to, to come into place like Norton Rose each day. I think one of the, the most challenging and interesting things would be um, looking at things from a commercial perspective. Um, obviously, studying law and practicing law are very different and it's all well and good to find the, the legal answer, but having to look at that through a commercial lens and think, how can I provide a solution to the client? Um, how can I be an enabler rather than say, you can't do this because of section 573 of um, some act. Um, that has been a challenge, but also really interesting having to wrap my head around how I can um, actually help clients um, and apply the law for them. Thanks Remy, I appreciate it. Cheers guys. I'm going to um, read out one from Olivia, um, who apologises, can't come off mute. Um, the, the question's for anyone on the call. Um, can you speak, uh, uh, sorry, I'll take it back a step. Uh, Norton Rose Fulbright has, you know, placed a significant emphasis on your values. Um, so for, to anyone, can you speak on how um, the val th these values influence the way you go, you go about your work? Did that shocking justice, but... Hopefully that made sense. Let's throw Jimmy under the bus. Oh, very good. Look, so it's a really, really good question. So our famous values are quality, unity, and integrity. I think um, quality comes in the sense that we have, um, as most firms do, really high expectations to ensure that the advice and the work that we do is of the highest possible quality, not only internally, but also to our clients. Integrity comes to the fact that we, as a legal profession, always need to be doing the right thing um, by ourselves and by our clients. So that's kind of a given, I guess, as a law firm um, and then quality unity. And then I guess the other firm, I had to rattle them off as I was going, that's pretty bad, isn't it? Um, and then unity is all about doing it together. And for me personally, um, that is the, the core value that I love the most about working at Norton Rose Fulbright. It's the thing that underpins for me personally, in my role, everything that we do, and I think it really does underpin how we approach client solutions and working with clients to ensure that we're providing the best quality advice by doing it together, whether it's cross-discipline or within a silo team. Um, and so I think that the those three values really embody everything that we look for in our clerks and our grads, they underpin everything that we do as a firm, everyone across the firm and everyone lives and breathes these values. So I think, um, I think they're, they're per the perfect values for us as a firm nationally, but also globally as well. But um, that's, that's my take on that. Is a recruitment tip for everyone? Um, <laughs> make sure you're writing those down. What were the, what were the um, values again, Jimmy? So everyone can write that down. Okay, everyone, quality, unity, and integrity. <laughs> um, and if you can't find them on their website, then I will be very disappointed. <laughs> also, anyone else want to add to that? David or Laura, maybe? Yeah, all I'd add to that is... Um, I think Jimmy summarized it very well. And I was 
interested to see who answered whether they know them all off the top of their heads. So good work, Jimmy. Um, it's not like we're a um, Silicon Valley startup where everyone comes into the office in the morning and chants the values. Um, you know, they are written and around the firm. Um, and as Jimmy says, people, people sort of live and, and breathe them. But I think that's more born out of the fact that we're hiring people through the graduate program laterally that share common values with the people that are here. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in that, bring your whole self to work. Uh, I think there's nothing worse than people sort of trying to, you know, present a facade that they think they need to. Um, so our values are sort of part of that. You know, a group of like-minded people and, and these are sort of some values that we think we share. Um, but yeah, they're not, um, we're not chanting them every day. Awesome. I've got a few questions here that are coming direct. So um, excuse if it feels like I'm skipping past yours. I'm definitely getting through the list. Um, what one here from Lorena, um, a, a question about learning and development. Lorena, are you still on call and happy to tap yourself off mute? Yes, I can answer that, uh, ask that question. Sorry, Sam, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for your time as well today. Um, I'm Lorena and I'm from Melbourne. And my question, I guess, is mainly directed at Remy and Trilby and potentially Jimmy. Um, I'm just interested about the training and development opportunities at Norton Rose Fulbright uh, for clerks and for graduates. And I'm just curious if uh, to see what stood out for you, Remy and Trilby, with um, your development as a commercial lawyer early in your career. I'll start because I actually feel quite strongly about this. When people ask me why I like NRF, I think the training is probably my, as kind of boring, boring as that is, would be my number one answer. I think from day one in the clerkship, you'll have a series of, I mean, Jimmy is across the actual program. This is me four years dated, but um, a series of trainings about the kind of things you need to know. And I mean, wait, let me go back a step. I like to think of my law degree and well, no, I like to think of my legal foundations as a bit of a brick wall law school like every subject was a brick some bricks are sort of half chopped off because I was 20 and didn't really understand what was happening but they built up over time and there were a few small cracks and I think two things firstly the training program that I got as a clerk and subsequently as a grad coupled with when you start as a grad you'll do your legal admission course whatever that is in the relevant state I found that was kind of like the tar is it tar? I'm clearly not a construction person. The bits that fill in the wall that make it stick together. And I really do feel that that is really strong. Um, for example, last year, I started as a grad in March. And obviously, um, I'm from Sydney. So we went into quite a serious lockdown, I think in April. So we were at home kind of six, six seven weeks into our um, graduate. So um, graduate rotation. So suddenly, all the things that we had planned to happen um, in the office weren't on. And straight away, we just saw this huge uptick in really strong training sessions delivered on Zoom. And for me, that was actually almost better than if we were in the office. I mean, I won't touch wood, we're, not, we're getting out of lockdown soon, but like the opportunities that COVID gave us to log into as a seminar that we might not otherwise have been able to attend for me were really good. And I think the firm puts a huge emphasis on giving you sort of a quick kind of one-on-one or like a foundations across any practice area in the firm that you're interested in. So if you're in X team and you want to go to tax next, you can sign up to a seminar that is aimed at like a whole lot of different levels and quickly learn about like what is GST or you can sign up to anything kind of, and there really is a national focus on that. You can go, what are these new environmental laws in Victoria? And you can sign up to that as well. And I feel like that is really pushed. We have a dedicated learning and development team. And um, starting at the firm, I'm embarrassed to say as someone as young as me, I had no idea how to use Excel. I'm now proud to say I can use Excel. And I learned that through our L&D team. Um, I use that on client matters. Um, 
And that really builds from the clerkship into the grad program, into ongoing CLEs as you go. And if you're suddenly working on something and I'm like, so I got to the end of my Excel knowledge and I can message the L&D guy and say, Tom, can you teach me this quickly? I need it. And that's available. So I just think, yeah, the training program here is truly brilliant in my view. Yeah, I'll just echo everything that Trilby just said and add that I think the thing that stood out to me in terms of training was both the quality and the variety. Um, so you'll do technical stuff, which is team specific, but then you'll also have, um, I'm trying to think of a, a recent thing we did. We did one recently on upwards communication. So um, communicating with people, um, your senior, which um, is is difficult um, and it's something that we as as young lawyers need to learn about. There's a, a wizard here named Brett Dengate who's a, a senior learning and development consultant and he runs some of the most engaging training seminars I've ever been to. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really great. I'm trying to think another side initiative that my team does, we do these things called know-how sessions each week where someone else from the team gets the opportunity to um, present on a different topic and it can be literally anything. Um, so that's just a, a little side initiative that um, I really benefited from. I actually presented today um, and getting the opportunity to, to present and also to learn different topics each week um, has also been extremely rewarding. Great, thanks so much guys for answering that one. Awesome. Um, up next, I've got to sort of put a little bit of a list in the chat, but I want to throw to Thomas um, Hodgson. Thomas, if you're happy to take yourself off mute. Um, yep. Hi, awesome. everyone. Thanks for being here, as everyone already has said. Um, so I guess I want to know a bit more about sort of the dispute structure, because I know it varies from firm to firm. And I'm Sydney-based, and maybe Jimmy's the best person, but Martin, feel free as well if you want to speak i just want to know firstly does because in a big team like disputes does it follow a siloed or non-side structure so you're only really working for one partner or getting work from lots of partners and also would you mainly be doing say litigation or would you be doing a combination of different things like litigation international arbitration so would you like just do one or the other or would you get opportunities and exposure to like all the different areas in this big broad team sorry that's a long question <laughs> No, not at all. It's a great question. Thanks, Tom. I'll try and make this brief because I'm conscious that we've got about 10, 15 minutes to go. One of the really good things that we're doing in Sydney is that we're actually piloting um, a new concept called resource management, where actually um, all of the lawyers within our litigation practice are actually, um, I guess, being able to be utilised across the whole entire litigation practice. So you are not just aligned to one partner or one area of litigation, you get to experience a full range of it. So yes, you'll have a dedicated supervising partner that may specialize in say, international arbitration, as you mentioned, but you'll also get broader experience in commercial litigation. Um, if there's a need, you can work in our insurance team, in our competition team, in our medical negligence team, or our intellectual property team, which all fall under the umbrella of litigation. There are obviously many factors which will lead you in terms of being able to work across all of those different groups that I mentioned, but we definitely do not have a siloed approach to you purely working on a matter for whatever your supervising partner is working on. Um, and I think that Laura um, and David as partners outside of the litigation team, even in their broader team, can speak about the fact that we, we view our junior lawyers, it, we see great value in our junior lawyers working across a range of matters, different partners, different team structures um, in order to um, develop um, and get that experience under your belt. Um, as a junior lawyer rotating in that team. But Martin, do you, do you have points on that, particularly from a litigation perspective based on your experience? Um, yeah, like I would completely agree with um, the point you just made, Jimmy, about the, the value placed on sort of the breadth of experience, particularly in your clerkship um, and graduate program. Um, but I, I would definitely recommend um, 
you know, if you have a particular interest in, um, I think Thomas, you mentioned international arbitration, um, or if you know you had a particular interest in, say, um, regulatory disputes and investigations, um, you know, if you do clerk here and if you do go on to become a graduate, then you should definitely flag that interest, um, you know, irrespective of whether your immediate supervising partner practices in that area, um, because I think everyone. Um, that I work with is certainly open to sort of seeking out those opportunities um, for juniors to sort of ultimately you know, get you involved in what interests you and to, you know, to get you doing what you want to do. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to speak up if you, if you want to do something. Great. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Um, Jasmine, I might throw to you next. If you can... Um... And hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It's definitely a lot more engaging compared to some webinars that I've attended, so it's almost great. I have two questions and one of them leads on nicely from Thomas's question and Jimmy. Um, you touched on intellectual property. That's an area of interest to me. I do also have a science background and I know that um, Melbourne Rose Fulbright, is, they, they have been quite recognised and have a lot of rewards for this. Um, but it's because it's a niche area, it's hard to speak and find out more about it. So I was just wondering what I can do just to learn more about your cases and intellectual property as a whole, um, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, Jasmine, music tires, people that are interested in intellectual property. So that's great. The really exciting thing is that we've just appointed a new global head of intellectual property in uh, Francis Drummond, who's a partner based in uh, Sydney office, which is really exciting. So that's a, a cool development for us. In terms of being able to find out information, whether it's intellectual property or for any of you that have particular interest in teams, um, across the firm, there's a whole range of information on our website around the different practice groups that we have and the work that we have done in those areas. So not to kind of palm you off Jasmine or anyone else interested in these areas, but um, our website is really up to date with that information. Um, if you are, if you do have really detailed questions or you would like us to connect you with people, we're more than happy to do that. You can email us directly. Um, so I suggest if you're interested, just write this down on a piece of paper, if you can, at Australian dot, uh, sorry, australia.graduates at nortonrosefulbright.com and then we can connect you with people from different areas of, across the firm if you're interested in, in doing so. But Laura, as a partner in a team, do you have advice on how junior lawyers can find out more information around specific teams? Um, I certainly think that the, the website is already um, and, and the details online. Um, and it's also probably worth um, seeing what you can find out about um, uh, what those teams have published, um, uh, all of the all of the teams in our firm write prolifically on subjects very relevant to the work that they're doing, relevant to clients that they're working with, um, and those uh, articles are always posted through social media channels and onto the websites. And that's a really great way of engaging not just with um, the work that. NRF is involved in, but also in some of the specific issues in particular areas. Um, so I would definitely look out for those um, uh, sort of sort of articles and things. Um, and also, I, I think it's where you have a really specific interest. And Jimmy's mentioned this before, but um, on your application form, you know, express that as being something um, that particularly interests you and. Um, you know, a, a vast number of partners in the firm from all different practice areas are involved in the graduate recruitment program. I think we all love being involved in it, frankly. Um, and so there, there would likely be opportunities to meet people in particular practice areas of interest um, if you were to go through that, that process. Yeah, I agree. And just really quickly on that, Laura, from a grad recruitment perspective, we try and tee you up with partners from particular groups where you've expressed that interest, whether it's in your first 
or second round interviews. So if you're able to demonstrate or articulate particular teams that you're interested in will be a little strategic behind the scenes to, to marry you up with partners from those areas. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jimmy and Laura. Um, I did have another question, but in the interest of time, I think it's, I'm happy to pass it on to the last person who had a question. Um, which one was that question actually? Hold on. Jane. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Or correctly. Actually, I'll, I'll come back to your question, Jasmine, um, in, a, in a tick, because um, it, it is quite a good question. But I mean, just to flag, um, Jimmy and I are more than happy to stay on past four o'clock as well if, if people are comfortable and they've got time because there are a, a truckload of great questions um, in the chat at the moment, which is really good. Um, I'll also come back to um, the next person that I'd sort of flagged Jung's question because I just want to, while we still have uh, David and Laura, I'm not sure if they have to jump off right at four. Um, there is a great question here from Sandy. Um, Sandy, if you, I have to take something mute. Um, so my question was, I understand that Norton Rose Fulbright recently appointed a new global chief executive who's based in the US, um, but I do know that the previous global chief executive was based in the UK. So is this shift going to have an impact on, you know, the direction of the firm or the culture or the way that it operates? Sandy, A plus for doing your research. That's great. I think that's a question for Laura. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> um, I will also pass to David because he'll have his sense. Um, look, um, you know, we, it's, it's a really exciting time, I think, for the firm to have, um, you know, new leadership. Um, our previous um, global chief executive was sort of instrumental in making Norton Rose Fulbright the global firm that it is today. Um, he set the firm on an incredible growth trajectory and um, really built the foundations for where we are now. Um, and, and now with Jerry taking over um, as a leader of the firm, he is obviously um, working to, to really build on that to the next phase of, of growth for the firm um, and really um, honing in and uh, refining some of the areas where we've had incredible success. Um, I'm personally not expecting to see a... Um, you know, significant change away from where we have been heading um, our, our values, the core things that impo are important to us as a firm remain the same. Um, but it is really now, I think, an exciting time to, to move forward. Um, David, I'm interested to hear your views on, on, the, view, on the topic too. Yeah, uh, thanks, Laura. And yeah, interesting question to reflect on for us. Um, I mean, aside from the obvious sort of hearing a, a British accent to a, a very drawn US accent that Jerry has, um, sort of showing you that we're dealing with a, with a sort of new jurisdiction as head, um, is the fact that the US is by far and away the largest legal market in the world um, by a long shot. Uh, I think for global firms to, you know, really increase their footprint, US is somewhere you have to be playing. And I think the firm was conscious of that when you know the new chief executive partner was elected um, so i think that is a positive thing um, what is interesting and will be interesting in the coming years is sort of the split between us practice uk practice and australian practice because the us is a very litigious market i think sort of 70 percent of major firm revenues is litigation and then the remainder is the front end stuff whereas it's completely the opposite in australia and in the uk it's somewhere in between so I think we will naturally see some changes, but as Laura says, sort of the core principles and culture of the firm will remain the same. Um, it's really just at the margins what the particular focus of Jerry's is. And, you know, he's in the process at the moment of putting in place his new team leads globally, focuses of those different departments. So Laura will have hers um, as we do in M&A. Um, and look, I think it's quite exciting um, Peter Marta was in the seat for a long time. So change is, um, change is good. Awesome. Sorry, Sandy. 
Oh, no, I was just saying thanks for answering. <laughs> awesome. Um, Laura, David, we've got another couple of minutes as well. There is another great question here from Diego. I did want to throw back your way again. Um, we all good? Yeah, yeah awesome. Diego, uh, and again, I'll come back to all the, that, the, the list as we're coming through, but uh, there's a question here from Diego uh, Nunes um, to both David and Laura. Diego, we happen to take yourself off mute for that one. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thank you for the time to ask the question. Um, it was just a question to David and Laura. As you guys were mentioning, every firm might seem similar from outside, but I just wanted to know how do you see your leadership reflected in the way your teams work, um, the way they engage and the way um, you feel they connect with each other. And particularly to Laura, um, I'm a lawyer overseas as well, and I'm requalifying here. So I wanted to know how was your experience joining uh, Norton Rose Fulbright and um, what did you consider when you decided to join it? Thanks. Um, David, do you want to take the first question? I can answer the second or what's... Sure. Yeah, sure. That's, that suits me. Um, thanks, Diego. Uh, I think, look, each team's different. Each partner's different. Um, certainly for me, there are a couple of team members of mine that have sort of been along the journey with me at, at different firms um, that I know very, very well. Um, we have a relationship that probably goes beyond, um, you know, I guess that of partner and staff. Um, and I also try and run a very sort of flat line structure, if that makes sense. I think everyone in the team from graduate up has something valuable to add. Um, and a case in point, just picking up one of the earlier questions is one of the guys in my team's big into cryptocurrency, online gaming, um, you know, EA sports, stuff like that. Um, and he brought to me about six months ago opportunities for m and in the online gaming space, which was just not something that I naturally would have looked at or thought about. Um, so he's been working up a bit of a strategy through his contacts to go to market with that. Um, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I just raise that by way of example, I guess, of someone at any level in the team having something sort of valuable that they can add and own. Um, I'm also very big on, you probably heard me say it a few times, but just the culture piece. So a couple of the guys in the team, you know, they love their gaming, like Digimon, I think are these cards that they play. And, you know, we'll knock off, say it's a heavy night and it's late and I'm going home to my family. And, you know, they'll all sit down and have a round of cards for half an hour. And I think, you know, geez, don't you see enough of each other? But I think there must be that, um, you know, we all, we all like being busy on a deal um, and we celebrate the wins. Uh, and I think that that creates hopefully a, a, a sort of sticky and collegiate culture. David, do you know what Digimon is? Uh, yeah, I've been looking at the cards, actually. So I do now. <laughs> <laughs> I do now. I might have to get you to tell me sometime because I'm not sure <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, just picking up on your second question, Diego, um, uh, I, I moved over as a, uh, I was about three or four years qualified in the UK when I moved over. And, and I know we maybe keep going back to it, but for me, it was very much around cultural fit. Um, I wanted a firm where my, um, you know, experience and, and expertise would be valued by the partners I was working for at that time. Um, and, and again, where I could really feel that I could bring my whole self to work. Um, and that was one of my key criteria um, when I made the decision to move into the Australian market. Um, and when I was interviewing the firms, um, you know, the, as we've said, the there's a lot of there's a lot of top firms in in the market and where you can get incredible experiences but it's some of those extra pieces that were very important that it's the culture it's the learning development opportunities um, and that rounded piece of being being part of the firm's community thank you thank you very much i i appreciate um your answers and also knowing that you started, I think, at CMS and I started at yeah, one of the CMS branches as well. Oh, also, yeah, thank you. No, you're very welcome. I'm going to throw back to that second question of Jasmine's. Now I've covered those sort of questions, particularly directed at Laura and David. Um, 
mind you, that second question is for anyone. So Jasmine, are you happen to ask that second part? Um, and then we'll go to Jiong next. If you're still here. Of course, thanks again, oh, yep. Sam. So my second question was, um, yes, aimed at everyone except Jimmy. So sorry, Jimmy. But um, I just wanted to ask if anyone has a unique um, perspective on a challenge they face within the case and how exactly they went about resolving it. I think we hear a lot about, oh, like what are the most interesting cases, which is great to know, but you don't always see the adversities published online. So I'd love to hear from someone. Who's kicking us off? I have to pick on someone. Martin? Don't be shy for me. <laughs> Um, racking my brains. I think um, that obviously every you know, case in a litigious sense has challenges in that, you know, you're presented with a, a generally pretty complex issue um, or issues that you sort of unpick over, um, you know, a number of years. Um, and so this might be a bit underwhelming, but I think um, particularly at sort of a junior level um, issues, issues that you are sort of more likely to encounter and have to experience um, and work your way through are really sort of practical things. Um, so an, an example, in my first graduate rotation, I was in the property team um, and I was um, working on a settlement, um, like a conveyance of um, a sort of, you know, relatively small commercial property um, and a certain notice had to be delivered um, via fax by a certain time. Um, and me sort of X weeks into my graduate rotation, um, faxed the notice to Norton Rose. Um, instead of the other side solicitor. Um, so, and, you know, I had a massive freak out because I remembered a case that we studied in, um, you know, legal ethics um, about a notice not being delivered and, you know, the consequences of that and the transaction falling apart. Um, so I had my freak out and, you know, dealing with that issue was to, you know, bluntly walk into my partner's office and be like, hey, I just realised I did this and now it's past five o'clock and you know here I am thinking that it's the end of the world and he was like oh I'm just send it to the right address like why would anyone actually terminate this like this transaction it's, it's fine um so I think uh, I admit that's probably underwhelming in terms of the question that you're asking but I think sort of in terms of dealing with issues as a junior that you're going to be personally responsible for um those are the types of things that you sort of need to stop and be like okay what do I do to fix this and nine and a half times out of ten it's do nothing and tell the person that you're working under Thanks, Martin. And I don't think it's underwhelming at all. I think, if anything, saying that you're a senior associate now, it's so good to hear something from when you were a grad and how it was like the end of the world, but it really wasn't. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I think yeah, like everyone listening, like everyone makes mistakes and no one expects you to sort of walk in on day one of your clerkship or your graduate program and know what you're doing um, or be perfect in each task that you're given. Um, but it's a willingness to acknowledge what you don't know, acknowledge when you think you make a mistake, um, and learn from that and not make the same mistake again. Yeah, I agree with that, Martin. I'm not sure, Jasmine, whether the question was directly aimed at mistakes we've all made, but um, I've got a great one from when I was junior. Um, we were working, so I was an article clerk as it was back then, but effectively a graduate now. And we're working on a um, IPO, so listing a company on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, and you generate a glossy prospectus as part of that, and that goes out to all prospective investors to decide whether they want to invest. And the application form, which is at the back, you tear it off, fill out how many shares you want, send it back with a check. Back then, that's the way you did it. And we worked out after thousands of these things had been printed, sent, people had returned forms, the IPO had closed, was successful, that buried in the back in the fine print on the application form was a, if you wish to apply for square bracket insert. Anyway, as the most junior person feeling like I had responsibility for doing all of the sort of final detail checks, um, I thought I was gonna get fired. And it was a great lesson for me early on in my career that, you know, I think there's this assumption that someone higher up the chain will be looking at everything uh, in as much detail as you are. And, and that's often not the case. So um, yeah, I, th I think as Martin said, we all, we all make mistakes. You all will at some point in your career. So you just learn from it. Thanks, David. 
Any other examples? I was again not really answering your question, but on the line of mistakes. My name's Trilby. I have never met another Trilby. And I used to I once sent an email to myself, which was a really dodgy draft first advice, and I typed in TRI enter, didn't check it as a note for everyone, check what you send, and sent it to Trisha Hobson, our global chair at the time. <laughs> so that wasn't great. And uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, so that's, that was a good lesson in double checking everything you send before you send it. Thankfully, she was internal. Don't think it bothered her too much to read my really dodgy advice that had things like, check this, is this even right? Highlighted. Um, so yeah, that was my mistake story. Did she reply to me? She didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what that says about it. <laughs> Thanks, Shelby, and thank you all for answering my question in a different way. It's been interesting to <laughs> all of your mistakes. Awesome. I'm going to throw it to Jiong next. Um, Jiong, are you on the, still on the call and happy to take yourself? Yep, there we are. Yep, I'm here. Whoop. I'm not sure if anyone else can hear, but it's coming in a bit, just a bit soft. Sounds like you're a bit far away from the mic. Um, try one more time, otherwise I can read it out for you. Yeah, that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll read it out for you if that's if that's okay. Um, the, the question is, um, if I have a lack of experience in the legal industry, and I guess it's probably mostly at Jimmy, um, how can I make my application stand out? It's a great question as well. That is, that's a really great question. And this is a question that we get asked a lot. I think th there are two things which come to mind with this particular topic. Firstly is what we look for in application above anything else is genuine interest and enthusiasm in wanting to gain experience working in a commercial law firm and to be able to articulate that you are genuinely committed to wanting to start a career in commercial law because using a law degree, there are so many different paths and avenues that you can go down. But what we really want to see, whether it's me who reviews every application or if it's David or Laura as an interviewing partner interviewing you, they want to get to know and really understand why you're interested in commercial law. And that comes down to every single person applying for our clerkship program, irrespective if you have legal experience or not. So just think about how you can position that and articulate that really passionately and authentically. The second bit of advice I have is that um, irrespective of whatever work experience you have, um, what we look for is the attributes that Think about how you can position yourself in terms of how you've demonstrated or developed the skills that are really important in a commercial lawyer. So they're things like your ability to work well with others, your ability to communicate both verbally and also over written communication, your ability to work well with others as part of a team and your ability to put clients first. Now you can demonstrate those skills in any work experience that you have had, whether it's tutoring, whether it's working in retail, whether it's working as a paralegal in another law firm or in a boutique law environment, it doesn't matter. I honestly do not really care what your work experience is because I look for the attributes um, that you've been able to develop and the skills that you've developed so that when you were to join us as a potential summer clerk, you can hit the ground running and we see the potential in you. So think about how you can demonstrate those attributes um, when talking about your work experience. That's my, that's my personal perspective. But David, if you have a different take on that, or do you agree? No, I think that's I think that's right, Jimmy. There's sort of no work experience prerequisite per se. Um, I think if you've got it, 
definitely call it out because it's good. But if you don't, um, you know, that's not to say you're not going to get a, a clerkship because everyone has to start somewhere, don't they? So I think in that instance, you know, you talk about what other experiences you have that have um, taught you skills and characteristics that you think would be helpful to you in a law firm environment. That could be from a casual job. Um, it could be anything, you know, helping with younger siblings while you're trying to balance your law school studies. Um, casual work, um, you know, other, other things that you might have done, um, extracurricular activities. Um, so I think you can, you can sort of reflect on all of those things and um, make a pretty compelling case even without direct legal experience. Providing us with great tips. Do either of you have any examples of like a good, maybe particularly Jimmy, if you're reading every application, um, of someone who's done that really well, for example? Oh, God, Sam. <laughs> spot here. Um, look, I don't have a particular example that springs to mind, but I think people that have. I think one thing that people kind of worry about, and maybe I, I'm happy to be challenged on this, but people that say, for instance, don't have legal experience. So people that have worked, say, at Macca's or in, you know, at Maya or DJs for a number of years think, oh, these aren't translatable skills. But in fact, they are because every day you're dealing with customers we all know that customers think that they're always right and they can be somewhat challenging. So you're able to demonstrate that you're putting clients first and dealing with them at every single interaction, every second, every day when you're at work. And as part of those environments, you have to always think about how you work with teams and with other people to come up with solutions and provide a great experience to customers and, um, and people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think the people that shine in terms of their application are those that are able to demonstrate those attributes that David and I mentioned, irrespective of whatever your background is. The other thing that I will say that is really important for us is that we're really big on personality and authenticity. We want to get to know the real you. Um, and to help with that, um, we'd love to know what makes you unique. We'd love to know what you're interested in outside of work. David mentioned earlier a really good point, which I'm 100% in agreement with, in that um, being someone that you're not is exhausting. None of us, uh, I'm, I'm sure we've all tried that at some point. It's exhausting. And to be perfectly honest with you, throughout the recruitment process, we ask questions to get to know the real you. And we'll be able to see through that if you're not being authentic. So some of the best interviews that David and I and Laura have had are those where people have put down on their CV what they're passionate about outside of work and we're able to have a conversation directly around that to get to know an individual on a more personal level on top of all the standard questions that we ask throughout the recruitment throughout an interview um, so i i highly encourage you to think about how you can position yourself around what you're passionate about outside of work outside of study outside of law as well Awesome. Hopefully that's covered off a few questions there because there's a lot from a variety of people, Stephanie, James, um, just to name but a few. Hopefully that answers a lot of questions about, about that. Um, I've, gonna, there's, a couple, there's only a few more minutes left that we'll probably um, run through. So we'll finalise a couple of last questions now. But I want to throw next to um, Mohammed. Uh, I was questioning about the DNI committee um, and then maybe to Dan canter next about a day in the life um and if you got any last questions get them in now and i'll probably choose one last one after that as well but um Muhammad, you have to take yourself off mute hi thanks for giving up your time this afternoon um, my question is um what type of events and initiatives 
have the diversity and inclusion committees undertaken recently in the Sydney office. Um, and may I quickly add as well um, to Jimmy, um, are you accepting applications from final year students in Sydney? Uh, if not, are offices around the country accepting that for final year students? I'll just jump in on that last point. Thanks, Mohammed. Yes, we do accept final year applications across all offices. So you're all good on that front. Thank you. But I think that's a really great question for Laura, who's actually the head of the day and I committee in Sydney. So couldn't have picked a more perfect question for you, Laura. So over to you. Thanks, Jimmy. And thanks for your question, Mohammed. Yeah, I chair the Sydney Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, I also sit on our national um, diversity and inclusion committee and um, uh, in, in my view and um, particularly the state based committees have um, two important roles um, uh, one of them, one of which is organizing events and, and seminars which which I'll come to, um, but the second part is being um, a, a sounding board and a voice of um, a, a diverse group of people from across the firm um, to feed into the firm's um, DNI agenda, and that's everything from um, how we go to market um, uh, in you know grad recruitment through to lateral hires, um, how our policies and our frameworks are put in place to ensure that. Um, it reflects the diversity within our firm, that it encourages diversity within the firm, and also it encourages people to feel included and part of what we do. Um, and, and actually the Sydney D Diversity and Inclusion Committee is made up of um, people from every level within the firm, from within business services, from within the office management teams, and from within the legal teams. Um, covering a, a vast array of um, different perspectives and interests. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, events have been a slightly different format to perhaps other years. Um, but we, um, for example, this year have, uh, we always host something for International Women's Day. Um, this year I um, interviewed um, uh, the Honourable Justice Patricia Bergen um, in relation to some of her experiences. Um, we also um, have other events coming up. Um, we, we're planning one at the moment which has a particular uh, culturally, cultural diversity um, focus. Um, but within um, the DNI team, we also have a number of um, sort of sub teams. Uh, we have a very active Pride. Um, uh, committee in the firm. Um, we have a, a cultural diversity think tank that is really leading some of, um, you know, how as a firm we want to um, encourage and, and grow um, diversity within all kind of um, fact, sort of spheres of, of what diversity means. Uh, and so it's a really important part of um, the work that lots of us are involved in. Um, and I'm really loving being part, sort of leading the committee now because hearing some of the perspectives of people from out the, from throughout the firm, um, re really I think as leaders of the firm gives us um, so much insight as to really how we can keep moving forward. Thank you, Laura. Awesome, I might throw to um, Dan next and in the interest of time, I've probably got yeah, about four, four minutes left. Um, so I might throw it to Dan Cantor next. There was a question here about a day in the life. I think it was for Martin. As yeah, well. see, I, I was going to ask that, but I feel like I can get in touch with Martin and talk his head off on a lit. Maybe for the benefit of everyone else, I asked the general question I had in there. Yeah, um, for being, uh, if uh, anyone could speak on um, how the firm manages workflow and task allocations and whether that varies amongst the different practice groups. Feel free to answer that one, Martin, um, if you've got some input. Sure. Um, well, I, yeah, I think it, it does vary um, between teams. So um, in my team, for example, um, I, I work for one partner, so he tends to have a pretty clear idea of what um, each of his lawyers has on. 
Um, and then we, our team has um, like a fortnightly workflow, like a formal sit down meeting um, where we talk about, you know, key things that we've got on for the, the coming week. Um, and then sort of, you know, in, as you know, a more senior lawyer in the team, um, you know, I'm responsible for then pushing work down to the associates, the grads, the, the current winter clock in our team um, and, you know, and supervising and progressing things with them. Um, I think litigation, because a lot of the matters that we work on are sort of, you know, longer term, big pieces of litigation. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I'll have carriage of one or two streams of evidence. So I'll be responsible for, for certain things. Um, and it might be that another associate or senior associate in the team is carrying something else. Um, and, you know, and the partner sit, sort of sits over us and manages um, how, how, what we're producing in sort of those work streams. Um, or it may be, you know, if it's something smaller, like a little, a piece of work that's been referred in from say our property team, um, you know, I might, have largely unsupervised carriage of that sort of drafting a letter here and there, um, working with a partner in the property team um, to, you know, to resolve a, a little issue that's come up in one of their transactions. So it, it really depends. Um, but, and I think it is very sort of team dependent, um, but so that that's my experience. Um, you know, it's the partner obviously has a sense of what's going on, um, but then it's, um, it's on the, the senior associates and the associates to sort of um, to push the work along. Thank you. Awesome, I reckon with the last minute we've got less left, um, I've got one question I want to address to everyone, um, uh, but I, I'm conscious we haven't gotten through every single question you had have been, as I've said, a lot of really good questions. So congratulations to all of you for uh, coming prepared and the like. Um, so before I launch into my final question, Jimmy, is there a, a good place for anyone who's feel like that the question's been missed to get in contact? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sam. I'll put this, I'll write this as a message, but if you do have any burning questions, just feel free, feel free to fire them off to our grad recruitment inbox, which is australian.graduates at nortonrosefulbright.com. So I'll put that in the message now so that you can um, copy and paste that and then fire away with any questions that you have and we'll reply in the next 24 hours. Awesome. Well, while I've got you, but my question is for everyone, but I'll start with you. Um, in, you know, one sentence or less, um, what is your favourite thing about working at Norton Rose? Um, one, one sentence, Sam, not. that's too hard to be able to do. <laughs> um, for me, the thing that I love the most, without sounding like a cliche, the thing that I love the most about working at Norton Rose is its focus on, its genuine focus on the development of people and how it includes diversity at the heart of every single thing that it does. Martin, have you been asked next? Uh, it's the people, hands down. Easy. David? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, great work and good people. And Laura, bring us home. The people and, and our clients. Awesome. Well, thanks to everyone for today. It's been a great session and thanks particularly to um, all our panellists who stuck on much later than I had promised that they would be here for. Um, and to everyone, every one of you for the really, really well thought out uh, and great questions. Apologies, we couldn't get through all of them. Um, it, it was just so many great questions. So cats off to you all for coming really well prepared uh, and really thinking about these sort of questions really puts you, I think it's a good state for all, you, you know, the re remainder of your application period as well. So um, as a reminder, applications are currently open. So get them in as soon as possible, particularly if you're in Sydney. Um, but thanks once again to everyone for today and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>